So tonight is, on the one hand, a, a somber night. Uh, on the other hand, it is an event that has set in motion a tremendous and monumental victory for mankind. Uh, we can't help commemorate tonight without glancing ahead to Sunday and thinking about the resurrected Christ. It's only Good Friday through the lens of Resurrected Sunday. It's kind of like a movie. I think the reason why movies can take us on such an emotional journey is because we're blind to the outcome of the tragedy or the dilemma. Just recently, I watched one of the opening scenes from the movie Finding Nemo. It's that scene where Nemo separates from his dad, and then two divers come down, and they capture Nemo, and they whisk him away. And his father's left feeling helpless and in turmoil. And it's this heart-wrenching scene. Apparently, I get caught up in these cartoons. But I had, to, I had to think ahead to the end of the movie and think about the reunion scene between Nemo and his dad just to settle my heart. And so with Good Friday, we have the luxury or the vantage point to know how this is going to finish. But I think it, it's important that if, if we can isolate the crucifixion as its own event without thinking ahead to how the story is going to finish, hopefully we will experience an increase in sorrow. For the disciples and for Jesus' loved ones, for those that were present, they had to experience the grief, the heartache, the despair, and the sorrow as they watched that person that they loved be crucified. They didn't have the script for how this thing was going to play out. I think back to Mark 15, and it says that from a distance, Jesus' mother watched as her son was crucified. Even if they had understood, even if they did know what was going to take place on Sunday, they still had to agonize and watch the horror of Jesus' execution. So this evening, we're going to recount the crucifixion, and, and we're going to focus our attention on one specific aspect of it. Now, sadly, we don't have the time uh, to go through the full account. So what I want to do is I want to give you a brief overview of some of the things that took place on that Good Friday. So let me give you a 30,000-foot view of the day. A lot took place in a very small window of time from the moment Jesus was arrested to when he was, uh, he was on the cross. It's about nine hours, and a lot took place in that time. As we're going to read, you're going to see that Jesus went through six different trials and this all took place before he was put up on the cross. So first of all, the preceding week before Good Friday really contributed to what took place with his capture and the trial and the coming crucifixion. Much happened in that week that really did lead to that moment. In fact, after his triumphal entry, which we went through last week, on that Sunday night, the following morning, the first order of business for Jesus was to go to the temple, upturn the tables, and cast judgment on the Pharisees for their misuse of the temple. Uh, on the Tuesday, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Pharisees down at the temple again and got into heated conversation about marriage and taxes. And again, Jesus was very censorious to the Pharisees. And so as each day passed, tensions rose, in particular with the Jewish authorities. So as we get towards the end of the week, just before Good Friday, Jesus' followers are thinning. There is the disciples and just a few left, only a few remain. And of the few that remain, one of them is going to deny him three times, and one of the others is possessed by Satan and is going to betray him with a kiss. On the last night before his arrest, Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, and they were having communion uh, together. They were having the Last Supper. 
Soon after that, Jesus, that they leave and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is just at the base, at the bottom of the Mount of Olives, in between the Mount and Jerusalem. And it says that Jesus went by himself and he prayed and he, and he said to the Lord, if it is possible, let this pass from me. And it wasn't. There was no other way for man to be reconciled to God. So I think this is a good place for us to pick up the story. And just like with the triumphal entry, the crucifixion story is told in all four Gospels. So what that does is uh, each of those accounts layer in just a little bit more information, which really gives us quite a, a broad or a complete picture of what took place. Okay, so it's 12 o'clock in the morning on the Friday. It's midnight. Jesus has been in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's late And Judas has procured some soldiers and has arrived to arrest Jesus. And this is where he is going to betray Jesus with a kiss. This is that moment where Peter drew his sword and took a swing at one of the soldiers and cut off his ear. Jesus tells him to stand down, stand down, Peter. And not only does he heal that soldier, but Jesus willingly goes with the soldiers and is detained. Now it's one o'clock in the morning, and this is going to be the first trial of Jesus. He's going to stand before a man called Annas, who is a former high priest. And Annas is going to try and get Jesus to say something, to indict himself, so that they would have a reason to kill him. Well, that doesn't go well. And so Annas then takes him over to the high priest, who's actually Annas's son-in-law called Caiaphas, he takes him there for Jesus' second trial, and again, they're both going to try and get him to say something that would bring harsh judgment upon himself. But again, that is very unsuccessful. And at about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus will stand before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is a group of, uh, it's an assembly, 71 elders and priests that are the ruling body of Judaism. They would rule on religious matters and some civil matters. They had a a lot of authority and they were highly regarded. And so now the Sanhedrin are now going to stand before Jesus and they're going to question him. And they're actually going to be in cahoots together and come up with a plan to have him charged with things that aren't true. It is very difficult to put an innocent man on trial So it's no surprise that they are now at their third trial with the Sanhedrin. Well, that doesn't go well. And one of the restrictions that exists for the Jews, one of the restrictions on the Sanhedrin, with all the authority that they have, they do not have the authority for capital punishment. They are unable to take a man's life. That had been rescinded from the Sanhedrin years earlier by the Romans. So what does this mean? This means that the Jews need to get some buy-in from the Roman authorities. And so that's going to lead to his fourth trial at six o'clock in the morning. Jesus is going to stand before Pilate. Now the problem is Pilate can't find a reason to have Jesus killed. He's feeling a whole lot of pressure from the Jews They're giving him argument, they're making accusations, and Pilate is, I have no reason to to kill this man. I'm not willing to do that, but there's a lot of pressure on them from the Jews. And in that conversation, Pilate finds out that Jesus is from Galilee. He catches a break because now he can send them to King Herod because that's his jurisdiction, so Pilate won't have to make a decision on this. So the guards, they now take Jesus and they take him to Herod. This is going to be the fifth trial. Jesus is going to stand before Herod. Herod knows exactly who Jesus is. And actually, he's been waiting to see Jesus, and he wants to see a miracle. He wants to see his power. So he says to Jesus, all right, show me something. Do these things you do. And Jesus is silent, and he is not going to comply. Now, it's probably a good thing, because if he had complied, if Jesus had done what he could have done, I think Herod probably would have freed him. It would have stopped 
the plan that was in motion, something that Jesus was in control of and was willfully heading towards the cross. So he doesn't give Herod what he wants. So Herod ridicules him and mocks him and sends him back to Pilate without judgment. So here we are now. At 8 o'clock in the morning, Jesus is on trial with Pilate again, his sixth trial of the night. Now, you remember the tradition of the Jews that they, they would release uh, one criminal, the people's choice. They could vote. Who do you want to be released? So Pilate thinks, okay, this is a good way for me not to have to charge Jesus. I will just put it out to the vote. Which one of these guys do you want to free? Here's a man called Barabbas. He's a murderer. He's been arrested for an insurrection. And here's Jesus. Well, we don't really have anything on him. And the Jews voted for the release of Barabbas over Jesus. So at this point, Pilate washes his hands of the whole thing and hands him over to the will of the Sanhedrin. And he has issued a guilty verdict. So this is about 8 o'clock in the morning. It started at midnight. This is a long night of trials. Standing before the religious authorities, standing before the civil authorities, and now here at 8 o'clock in the morning, a guilty verdict has been issued to Jesus. So the soldiers are going to dress him in a purple robe and a crown of thorns in a mocking way, and they're going to scourge him and they're going to beat him. The Roman guards are going to be brutal in the way they handle him. And they're going to mock him and ridicule him. And now Jesus begins his journey towards the cross at Golgotha. It's now nine o'clock in the morning. Jesus is fixed to the cross. Flanking Jesus on either side are two criminals. One who will recognize him as God and will receive salvation The other will continue the mockery. Three hours later, at midday, it's 12 o'clock, total darkness is going to surround the land. Three hours after that, Jesus has now been on the cross for six hours. It's 3 p.m., and Jesus dies. Jesus gives up his spirit and utters those last words of, it is finished. At that point, Jesus' body is taken down and placed in a tomb. Well, I share that overview with you to give you a sense of the timeline and the sequence of events. From that moment he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas betrays him, and it begins these trials that go all through the night. To eventually he's put up on the cross at nine o'clock in the morning. He'll be on that cross for six hours. And then finally he takes his last breath. So let's jump into the story when Jesus is carrying his cross. At that moment that Pilate has ruled, he's, Pilate's made a decision about Jesus, and he's going to make his journey now to the Hill of Skulls, Golgotha. Uh, We don't know exactly how long that journey is. Some people say maybe half a mile. It's been a long morning of mock trials, these kangaroo courts that he's been a part of, all these false accusations. Now, worth noting at this point, before Jesus is about to start this walk where he carries his cross, he has been severely beaten. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 52, verse 14, It says that he was unrecognizable. That's how much of a beating and torture he had been subjected to. Now, carrying your cross through the streets, it's it's a common practice with the Romans. It wouldn't have been an uncommon sight in in Jerusalem. And I think there's a, a few reasons for that. Just to mention a couple, one is that it's it dissuades others from not submitting themselves to the Roman rule. So it's a good deterrent. Uh, Two, uh, in that journey, it actually gives an opportunity for someone to come forward with evidence for a convicted felon's innocence. But that didn't take place for Jesus. Uh, And thirdly, walking through the streets of Jerusalem with your cross brought much shame and humiliation. 
uh, to the convicted. So, considering it's the early hours of the morning, he has not slept, to say that he was in physical anguish, blood loss, weak, and fatigued and exhausted is a tremendous understatement. So that's the scene. That's where we're at. If you could turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15, uh, we're going to be in verse 16. Mark chapter 15, verse 16. Okay, it says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. Okay, so after being ruthlessly tortured by the Romans, Jesus is forced to carry his cross to the place that he would be crucified. Likely, due to his extreme torture, uh, Jesus was fatigued, he was exhausted, had no strength and unable to carry his cross. And in verse 20, you'll notice a gentleman by the name of Simon. Uh, now this man is recruited to carry Jesus' cross. It says, and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, to carry his cross. Okay, so let's talk about Simon for a few moments. I think this is interesting, and uh, there's, some, there's something in this for us, and there's a picture of what our relationship to Christ is and what we're seeing here. So this is the first time we're hearing of this man, Simon. Now, obviously, the name Simon is a relatively common name. Uh, it was common with both the Jews and the Greeks, and we know that there are Simons mentioned in the New Testament, but there is some unique pieces of information that we're given about this Simon that helps us, helps us differentiate between him and maybe another Simon. One, as it says, he was from Cyrene. Two, he had two sons, Rufus and Alexander. So Cyrene uh, is in uh, northern Africa. It's modern-day Libya. Uh, so we don't, know a, we don't know a lot about this guy, Simon. The temptation is to assume that he was, on, was of African descent, that he was from Africa. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, I think it might be likely that he is a Jew. Uh, he's of Jewish ethnicity. And during the dispersion, he went to Africa. And I think he's probably coming back to his homeland for Passover. And he's bringing his two sons with him. So we don't know what his ethnicity is, and it really doesn't matter. He was clearly a man of faith to make that uh, pilgrimage back to his homeland. One piece of information that I think is unique to Mark's account, and it's not recorded in the other Gospels, is, is that he has two sons, Rufus and Alexander. So who are these guys? Well, the name Alexander appears in some other passages in the Bible, but it's highly unlikely that this is the same Alexander. And uh, the name Rufus, uh, it's possible that this is the same Rufus that Paul talks about in Romans, but we really don't know. Um, but I, I, all that to say, I think this is interesting that Simon, Rufus, and Alexander, they just are seemingly random additions to the crucifixion story. We know nothing about them. We don't really hear anything about them later on. But there they are, just inserted into the story. And what was required of Simon was to take the cross of the Son of God. Well, I think that in the Lord's sovereignty and in His wisdom, He put the story in here for a very important reason. I can't help but wonder 
if the disciples, when they saw this, when they saw Simon carrying the cross of Jesus and following him, I can't help but wonder if they recalled the words that Jesus shared with them a few weeks earlier. I'm going to have you now turn to Mark chapter 8, so you can head back a few chapters. I'm not going to have you move too much around the Bible. I don't want you to sprain a finger or anything like that. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, and this is where we're going to stay for the rest of the message. And we're going to be in verse 34, Mark 8, 34. So let me read this to you, if I can find it. There it is. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Let's stop right there. Okay, so with the image in our minds of Simon carrying this cross and following Jesus, let's go through this passage. And I just want to bring a few things to your attention and give you something to maybe search your heart on. So in verse 34, it says, If anyone would come after me. Well, if you have made a profession of faith, then you have vowed to follow Jesus. If anyone will come after me, that's us. We have made a profession to follow Christ. So the the Lord is saying to the crowd, if anyone comes after me, so church, this is you and I. Because not everyone who acknowledges Christ chooses to follow him. I'm thinking of Mark chapter 7. Verse 21, possibly the most haunting verse for us to meditate on. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a heavy verse and one of the more sobering ones, and it demands introspection from every man and every woman. When we read the the parable of the sower, remember the, the soils, the parable that Jesus tells? about the word going out and how it's received. We we see that parable and we know that there are varying ways that people choose to either follow or not follow Jesus after acknowledging him. Well, what is it to follow Christ? Well, um, Jesus is not going to be cryptic or ambiguous on this. The first thing he says, verse 34, is let him deny himself. So if anyone who will come after me, let him deny himself. Self-denial is not referring to some uh, monastic lifestyle or or depriving oneself of life's joys. That's not what self-denial is. Self-denial is not... Uh, dulling your personality or having some kind of stoic countenance. That's not what self-denial is. One definition of self-denial is the willingness to deny oneself's possessions or status in order to grow in holiness and commitment to God. It'd be fair to say that the opposite of self-denial is self-gratification. Self-gratification is is an active threat against your pursuit of holiness and your commitment to God. So Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Denying yourself includes overcoming the persistent fleshly demands of the body, also known as the carnal or natural man, and bringing them in submission to God's word. Self-denial is to deny the temptations of the flesh. It is to surrender one's ego, one's pride. It is only by God's grace and by the power of His Holy Spirit that we can even learn to deny ourselves. But self-denial is the marching orders 
for every Christian. This passage that we're reading is probably the most significant or most essential passage about discipleship in the New Testament. And it's the words of Jesus. And he is saying, if you want to come after me, you have to deny yourself. It doesn't feel optional when I hear it. I don't feel like I get to, uh, this is an elective task that I can participate in. So back to our text, verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Okay, so if we choose to hold on to the things of this life, we are not denying the flesh. We have an either or. These are mutually exclusive. You can't hold on to the things of this world and deny your flesh. It's one or the other. And God says, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny your flesh. And when we are choosing things of this world, it can cost us our soul. That feels like a big deal. There's a bit of a paradox to self-denial because you are deliberately not giving yourself to something. You're kind of with, you're restricting yourself from something. And in doing that, I think that's actually the greatest investment and greatest contributor to your spiritual condition. I think we are most satisfied and we are most content when we are denying the flesh. Uh, Augustine he puts it this way, if you love your soul, there is a danger of it being destroyed. Therefore, you may not love it since you do not want it to be destroyed, but in not wanting it to be destroyed, you love it. That's the paradox of what it is to not love the self and the things of this world is to save your soul. So, Let's keep going. Verse 35 goes on to say, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? We need to be continuously reminded that this is not our home. This, this is temporary. So profiting everything here doesn't really seem to mean too much, Right? When we remember that the things of this world and our fleshly desires don't profit us, when we realize there's no value in it, I think self-denial is a lot easier. Denying the flesh is a lot easier when you realize the flesh and everything it promises is worthless. Colossians 3 says, Set your mind on the things that are above not on the things of this earth. I'm reminded of a story. Uh, this is a story about a man who was coming to the end of his life. He was wealthy. He was a rich, a rich man. He had much gold and much treasure. And uh, he says to his wife uh, on his deathbed, he says, listen, honey, I worked hard for that gold, and it is my pride and joy I'm going to take it with me. So I want you to bury me with my gold. I want to be buried with it. So it's probably not what a wife wants to hear, that the family fortune is going with the deceased. So she honors that request, and in his coffin, she places all the gold. And he passes away, and he's standing before St. Peter at the pearly gates. This is the moment you realize that it's not a real story. He's standing before St. Peter at the pearly gates, and he's got a wheelbarrow full of gold. He's kind of looking in. He's kind of excited. Peter's about to invite him in. And St. Peter looks at him and says, oh, oh, welcome. I see you bought pavement. Uh, I'm not sure if you're laughing at home. I feel very alone with this joke right now, but I'll assume you're chuckling along. Because something that was of absolute value down here was worthless in heaven. And I think that's such an important thing for us to realize is that nothing profits us down here. Everything that we should be investing into, the self-denial, it is all going to echo in eternity. Okay, now that we've stopped laughing hysterically at that joke, 
Let's continue in our text. Verse 34. Take up his cross and follow me. To take up your cross, it comes at a cost. To take up your cross uh, may come with some suffering. It may be a burden. Self-denial on this side of eternity, has a little bit of collateral damage sometimes. It can be hard. You can be persecuted. You can be mocked. You can be ridiculed. You can go without. You can kind of be alone with your conviction and what you believe. And that's something that Jesus led the way on and showed us what it is to live that life. Especially when you think about the life that he had and the ministry and everything that he did. You think back one week before his crucifixion and everybody's like, Hosanna, glory in the highest. You're loved and adored by people and then, where is everyone? And as he's carrying his cross, nobody came to his defense and said, that's an innocent man. So sometimes carrying your cross comes at a cost And it can be very heavy-hearted sometimes. Now, in Luke's account, it says that Simon carried the cross behind Jesus. So the picture of Simon carrying his cross and following Christ is not a subtle picture of our relationship with Christ. And the overriding concept of this passage in Matthew 8, what we just read, is that we are to deny our flesh and grab hold of righteousness. That's what it is to take up our cross and follow Christ. It will potentially come at a cost and even suffering, but the profit of spiritual blessing and eternal life, it it transcends any of the profits of this world. Whatever it is that you can gain here, whatever you consider to be the greatest success, whatever world you can kind of create yourself, fame, riches, fortune, whatever all these things are, they, tr- they, they truly don't mean much. The only thing that really matters that you have is Christ. And the way you have Christ and the way you follow him is you deny your flesh. So church, this, as I mentioned, is arguably the most salient passage on discipleship in the New Testament. And if we are disciples of Christ, then we are to take up our cross. What is it to take up our cross? It is to deny the flesh and suffer well for the sake of Christ. And so when I think back to that moment where Jesus is for the last time has stood before Pilate and the verdict went out, guilty, death penalty, you're going to be crucified. And then he's going to carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem. That picture of God orchestrating in his sovereignty, that man called Simon, just to be pulled out of the crowd. I mean, imagine imagine what that was like for him or for his sons, for Rufus and Alexander. They're there. Simon's probably heard of Jesus probably well aware of his ministry, and here he is, he is watching him being paraded down the streets on his way to be crucified, carrying a cross. He's not even recognizable. He's been torn up, flesh hanging off him, and then a soldier grabs him against his will and says, hey, take up his cross and carry it and follow him. With that picture in your mind, you should have a clear understanding of what Jesus meant in Mark chapter 8. It says, if you want to follow me, you need to take up your cross. And how do we take up our cross? We deny our flesh. Why do we want to deny our flesh? Because there is no value and there is no worth in the riches of this world, especially if it comes at the cost of your soul. Because showing up at the gates before Peter and showing gold bars is worthless. And so as we follow Christ and take up our cross, may we do so pursuing righteousness, pursuing the the love, being willing to suffer. And so we're about to take communion together. 
And I'm not sure if, it, if it's possible to point to a single moment in the crucifixion story and say, ah, there, that's the most important point right there. I don't know if it's fair or smart to do that, but I'm going to. And I'm going to say that at that moment, at three o'clock on that Friday, after hanging for six hours, and he's going to die of asphyxiation, and the last thing he says before he gives up his spirit is he says, it is finished. I don't know, this feels like the most critical part of this moment. Why? Because it is finished in the Greek, it's an accounting term, and it means paid in full. That was the last thing that Christ is going to say. So at this time, I, I would, um, if you can grab whatever it is that you have for communion right now, I'm not sure if you've got to run to the refrigerator and pour some. I doubt highly that you have those little communion glasses or communion cups that we have here, so feel free just to kind of pour it into whatever cup that you have there. Maybe you have a big family chalice, and you're going to do that old school way of doing communion. However you want to do it, it's all about your heart and your mind, not the cup. Soon I'm going to pray, and what we're going to do is, um, as I'm praying, be meditating, be thinking about the words that I'm sharing with you. After I pray, we'll take communion together, but may we do so with the sacrifice of our Lord on the forefront of our hearts and minds. Salvation has come through the blood of Christ. He had to lay down his life. It says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Christ came to save us. So I'm going to pray for the communion. If you want to at this time take your communion, I'm just going to grab mine here. Once I finish praying, take communion and then we will close in a worship song.